Good evening and welcome to Monsters Among Us. I am your guide, Derek Hayes. Ooh, doggy. It's finally October, and it's our time to shine. But let me be honest with you. September was a real son of a gun, and I'm glad to have that nonsense behind us. And not only is it the beginning of October, it's also the very first episode of Season 18. And normally I come flying in here with all sorts of sound effects and loud but awesome music and themed episodes, the likes of which had never been seen. And don't worry, that'll all still happen next week. But due to our recent fire here on the mountain, which is still burning and threatening communities, our thoughts are with them and the brave men and women fighting it. But anyway, due to that week-long evacuation, I got pretty far behind with the show. And then having hometown legends right around the corner really messed us up. So that's my way of saying tonight I'm pulling the old switcheroo with the season opener. I promise we'll do all the fanfare next week. But in lieu of taking a break this week to catch my breath, I wanted to send something new through your airwaves. Digital airwaves, at least. So here I am tonight with another grab bag episode. Now as a reminder and to fill in the newbies, a grab bag is just like going to the dentist as a kid. When you're all done, you get to pick a little prize from a plastic bag or a cardboard box. You never knew what would be in there. A yo-yo, an army man, a bouncy ball. Hell, 50 bucks for all I knew. And that's exactly what the grab bag episodes of Monsters Among Us is like as well. You never know what you're going to get. And neither do I. Because I've chosen tonight's calls by name only. No theme, no research, no rhyme or reason. I just had a hunch. And also because I'm trying to save time, there'll be little commentary from me going forward. So join me as we randomly select what are sure to be some of the scariest calls this season. At least I hope so. And to get things started for us this evening, we venture to the state of New Hampshire. Aaron, welcome to tonight's program. Hey Derek, this is Aaron calling from New Hampshire. Wanted to share a story from when I was a little guy. So this is probably in 1985, 1986. In my bedroom, my window was facing the street that was probably 20, 30 feet away from the house. And I remember one night I had woken up and I saw what, you know, based on what other callers are claiming are very similar to the mirrored men. My experience is a little bit different, so curious what your thoughts might be. But I remember looking outside and seeing two or three what look like really, really tall individuals wearing almost like zoot suits walking down the street. And then when I say tall, uh, probably 15, 20 feet, I did a quick Google search and uh, telephone poles average about 40 feet. Uh, and they were about halfway up to the top of the telephone poles. But the other thing that was really strange that I haven't heard anyone else mention is they leaned really far back. So they were walking shoulder to shoulder. And the best way that I can describe it is like uh, in Michael Jackson's Moonwalker, uh, when they had that really exaggerated lean. I don't remember it lasting for particularly long. And, you know, obviously this is quite a while ago, but in terms of any lost time, I was a little kid, so I fell back asleep. So certainly can attribute it to that. So just curious what your thoughts are, if anyone else has had a similar experience, may be able to chalk it up to an overactive imagination of a little kid, but it seemed like there were too many parallels not to share. 
love the show, love everybody being willing to share their experiences. And thank you very much. Talk to you later. Bye. Thank you, Aaron. Now, it sounds like it could be our old buds, the mirrored men. Two or three identical figures in unison. Strange or outdated clothing. But truth be told, there are a few elements missing in this story. As Aaron had mentioned, no missing time that he could remember. And I don't recall any reports of the mirrored man being exceptionally tall. At least not as tall as Aaron suggested. And no odd or inclement weather, which is usually a staple for one of these sightings. But being that he was young, perhaps he simply forgot those details. Either way, it's a hell of a way to kick off this grab bag episode. Thanks again, Aaron, for calling in. Now, if you have a true tale to tell, call us at 888-608-NIGHT. That's 888-608-NIGHT. Or shoot me an email with a voice memo to Monsters Among Us Podcast at gmail.com. Now, let's reach back into the bag and select another name. Blue Line Bell. Welcome to tonight's program. Hi, Derek. I'm a longtime listener. I've been listening from the beginning. A Patreon supporter, money very well spent, and a first-time caller. I'm going to go by the name Blue Line Bell for anonymity's sake. So this story happened about 15 years ago in a rural town in upstate New York. Our property is about a half a mile from the end of our road, and there's woods on either side of the road that goes all the way down about three quarters, and then it opens up to cornfield on either side of the road, and then that road butts into a larger road. So at any rate, we often go for walks in the middle of the night if we wake up, or if it's really hot and it's hard to sleep, or if we just know we want to look at the stars or something like that. So. On this evening, we were walking down, we were at the end of the road before it hits the major road, and we were just standing there and talking. It's a really nice area to just stand and look at the sky, because with the cornfields, you can see all the way around, and you can see across the Canadian border and look at the lights of the factories and all kinds of different lights blinking, and it's incredible. So we were standing there and talking of what we were talking about, I have no idea, but we were a few feet apart and I saw this red nebulous light just pass between my husband and I. And I didn't know what to think of it. It went from one side of the road in between my husband and I and then disappeared into the woods. And I kind of just watched it as it happened and I didn't respond There was no sound, and for a second I thought that I had imagined it because it was so odd. It was such an odd thing. Of all the places that something could have passed, it passed between my husband and I, and it was like nothing I'd ever seen. So it was kind of a dark red, and I say light because we could see it in the dark. So for lack of a better word... I would say it must have been illuminated because it was dark out. I mean, the sky was lit up a little bit with stars, you know, like you could see some depth of the sky, but it was dark out. And so this object going through us had to have been light. So at any rate, it went from one side of the road in between my husband and I and then into the woods. And I have no idea what it was. And as we were standing there, I just was kind of dumbfounded, and so I just watched it. And then once it had passed, I stood for a minute wondering if I had imagined it or something, or if my eyes were playing a trick. And so I decided to ask my husband, did you see that? And he said, yeah, what was that? I said, I have no idea. And to this day, we have no explanation of what that could be. Because there's nothing. There was nowhere it could have come from. That, there was nothing that could have manufactured it. There was no vehicle. There was no light source. There was no building. There were no cars. 
there was nothing. It was just cornfields, and the nearest house is like a quarter mile away. It was just my husband and I, and this red blob of light, for lack of a better word. Yeah, I have no idea what it was, but I think somehow it is connected to some of the things that we've seen on our property and my parents' property over the years, and I'll call back with some of those stories. But yeah, I'd love to hear if anybody else has seen anything else like this, because it just defies explanation. Of all the things that I understand that could have made this light, there was no source, no source to make it. So yeah, I have no idea, and it really makes me question a lot about the world, about what we see. Yeah, that's it. I'll call back later with more. Bye. Well, that's a good way to ruin an evening stroll. Thank you, Blue Line, for the entry. Now feel free to file this one under Red Glowing Orb, because I've received dozens of other entries that seem to describe the exact same thing. Although none near as close as Blue Lines here. They got up close and personal with whatever that was. And although it'll remain a mystery, we appreciate you for taking the time to call in. Now, folks, I have to take a quick break, but when we come back, I'll draw a few more names out of the bag. Don't go anywhere. Is in the news. One of the extension ladders that was dropped in one of the right... That sort of rubbed me the wrong way. Dot com. Woo-hoo! Let's go! Now, as promised, another victim from the grab bag. And this one is a repeat offender. Gavin from North Carolina. Welcome to the program. Hey Derek, this is Gavin from Fayetteville, North Carolina. I'm calling about another entry. I actually am a repeat offender. I called in last year and I was glad to hear that my story made it to the podcast. Actually, my wife's story that was told by me made it to the podcast. But anyway, last week, me and my wife were going to sleep and... I just rolled over and I said, Ashley, do you hear that bell going off? And she just turned around and she said, no, I don't hear it. I don't hear it. But I just kept hearing this really faint bell. I mean, it was a bell. It sounded like ding, dun, 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 ding, dun, 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 ding, dun, dun, dun. And the creepiest part about it is, is that I could only hear it when I was laying down on my pillow. I went all around the room, I put my ear up against the wall, tried to do everything I could to hear that sound anywhere other than my pillow, turned off every sound in the room, and only you could hear it from my pillow, but you couldn't hear it anywhere else. I even tried removing the pillow from my side of the bed and just laying there, and you could still hear it just right there, just right on my side of the bed, on the left side of the bed. And man, it creeped me out. I could not figure out what it was. I tried turning off all the power to the house because I thought maybe it could be some kind of thing with the light sockets or maybe something with our Google camera sending a signal to our phones. I don't know. I thought of everything. But then last night, it happened again. And this time my wife also heard it. And it's just that same bell noise. It goes like ding, dun, dun, dun. Ding, dun, dun, dun. And man, I cannot figure it out. And, you know, usually I wouldn't be creeped out by a noise like that because, you know, it can happen from anywhere. But for me, it's just the fact that, I mean, it was only in that one spot. Why is it that only in that one spot in the whole house you can hear it? And as soon as you lay down in that one spot, you hear it. Makes no sense. But yeah, man, that's my story. Maybe somebody else has something like this. All right, man. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin. Now, first off, I hope you're doing all right back that way, Gavin. I can't remember exactly how close Fayetteville is to where the hurricane ran through, but the video and images from that area are heartbreaking. And that goes double for everyone affected by this terrible storm up and down the Appalachian Mountains. I know we have a lot of listeners from that area, just know that we're thinking about you. 
Now, I don't know how much this helps you, Gavin, but that sound was familiar to me. And after some contemplating, I might have finally put my finger on it. Way back in the day, the digital streaming service Roku had an error animation that sounded similar to what Gavin described. At least I think it was Roku. When the internet was disconnected or it was offline or something, some small character, perhaps a ball, would drop from above making the first loud bong sound, followed by a few other quieter bongs as the ball or character bounced to a stop. Then that process would start all over again. Now I spent way too long looking for this specific sound over on Google, but I wasn't able to find anything. Now if anyone out there listening knows exactly what I'm talking about or has access to the sound, send it in and let's see just how close I was. And Gavin, if you have a TV with a Roku in your basement, perhaps right below where you're sleeping, well then, I might be onto something. Of course, I'm always open to other suggestions. So hit me with those as well. And thank you again, Gavin, for the phone call. Now for this next entry, we head one state north. Haley from Virginia. Welcome to the grab bag. Hi, Derek. My name is Haley. I'm from Virginia, and I'm calling because I have a poltergeist story to share. In 2009, when I was 13, my family moved into a house built in the early 1900s. The attic was my bedroom, and from the beginning of our stay in that home, I could feel a presence, especially in the basement and in the attic with me. It was pretty mild at first, things you could just shrug off, like the feeling of being watched, shadows around corners, our bulldog would stare at the ceiling like he was following something. You know, I think I'd see someone out of the corner of my eye on my staircase and then they'd be gone. But the worst thing that happened was one night up in the attic, I was under my covers at three in the morning watching a very popular ghost hunting show. The host of the show said, can you make a noise? When all of a sudden in real life, across my room, there was a huge crash of glass. It was so loud, my ears were ringing. I was so scared, I thought I was going to die. I couldn't move. I didn't even hear my parents run up the stairs. They thought someone had smashed my window with a rock. When they make it up the stairs, I have enough courage to get up and we discovered that the source of the noise was a antique crystal lamp that I had in the middle of my dresser it had been broken right down the middle. It looked like it had been sliced like a cake. And even though my dad said, oh, you know, it's probably just a pressure crack that coincidentally snapped at three in the morning, just some strange defect in the lamp. <laughs> He put it outside on the curb in a trash bag at three in the morning and I slept with the Bible pretty much every night until we moved out of that house. <laughs> Several other weird things happened, but I'll save that for another time. I'm a new listener and I love the show so far. Stay spooky. Take care. Bye. Thank you, Haley. Now there is a subgenre of submissions. Ghosts reacting to paranormal television shows. I bet Haley isn't the first to experience this. And consider this your official call to action. If an entity in your house or home has thrown a plate at the ghost hunter guys or yanked the plug on ghost adventures, I want to hear about it. 888-608-NIGHT And thank you again, Haley, for sharing with us. In Southwest Gas and the city of Al you made the right choice. Now I happen to know the topic of this next entry, and it's in line with what we just heard. At least I think it is. Who's ready for more ghostly gossip? Jay from California. Welcome to the show. 
Hi Derek, my name is Jay. I'm from Southern California, though I grew up north from here in the Central Coast. So I wanted to share my experiences that I had as a kid living in my parents' home. Though I want to start off with saying that I've been working in the mental health field for over 10 years now, and I've considered different factors at play, including mental health when I reflect back on these experiences. So this started in about 1999 in my hometown. I was 10 years old and we had just moved into a new home in a newly constructed neighborhood that used to be fields. My mom had left me home alone one evening after we had just moved in to pick up my older siblings from after school. She just told me to, you know, not open the door and just stay put, so I did. I sat there in our living room watching cartoons when I heard the doorknob that led to our garage door, it was moving back and forth. So like the knob was moving back and forth. I looked up confused and I could see the knob moving almost like someone was on the other end, like desperately trying to get in. And I remember being scared because no one was home and the garage was closed. So it wasn't like someone was on the other end. So I just sat there watching it what seemed like forever. Really, it probably just lasted like a few seconds. Once it stopped, I thought I imagined it. And I remember thinking maybe some stray cat got into our garage and was playing with the knob, but that kind of seemed far-fetched because the knob is kind of high and cats are kind of small. So I was confused, but I never mentioned anything. And, you know, I just thought I imagined it. So a few months later, my older sister moved out for college, which meant I had the room to myself, but I started to get this weird feeling that I was being watched in my bedroom, especially from within the closet. At times it felt like someone was whispering, which really freaked me out. It still freaks me out. I mean, it would happen at any time of the day. So I just decided to start closing like my closet door because I felt super uncomfortable with the door being opened. So things continued to happen like the bathroom door across my room and my brother's room which is closed on its own um, and curtains would move on their own and trust me that I would check for drafts anything that would cause them to move you know I was trying all sorts of different things I remember once when I was in high school I was in my brother's old room writing a paper that was due the next day and by this time my brother had moved out so it was just me and my parents and I was up super late and it was like maybe one or two in the morning and I saw from the corner of my eye my brother's curtain fold inward like from the bottom as if someone was like gently lifting it up and it just stayed that way (laughs) and I froze and I couldn't believe what I was looking at And then it just gently unfolded itself back and went back to this natural position of it just hanging. And I was like so freaked out, but I made no response to it. So I just, you know, quickly turned off my computer. I had saved everything and, you know, quickly and like quietly and gently just left the room, closed the door and called it a night. Another time I had already moved out and I was visiting my parents for the weekend and I remember I couldn't get into my room to drop off my duffel bag and all my other things and when I finally got in I expected to find something blocking my door and then ended up finding all the pins from the door hinges piled neatly on the floor and I thought my dad must have been starting a project and when I asked my parents about it they looked at me confused and I showed them the pins and my parents responded with it must have been the hot weather that pushed them out especially because at this time my parents both started to experience weird things which they weren't open in admitting. The only reason I knew of it was because when I called, my parents would casually mention that they were locked out of the house after, you know, stepping out for a moment. And I'd be like, what do you mean you're locked out? They're like, you know, I just stepped out and I can't get back in the house. On other occasions, they would, my, my mom especially would mention things like she saw a shadow or she saw the lights turn on and just kind of thought oh it's kind of weird though each time they would blame it on some electrical issues or like faulty locks they always had an explanation for it so fast forward to 2014 
my sister held a backyard birthday party for my niece in which she invited her in-laws and that would end up being a really weird kind of event and would end up validating my experiences as a kid. So her brother-in-law was invited and he had never been to our house before, but I remember he appeared so uneasy during the party and I remember him looking incredibly uncomfortable when he had to use our restroom. And to be honest, I thought he was being a snob, though in talking to my sister sometime after the party, she had told me about a weird conversation she had with him in that he disclosed to her that, like, this is what he said. So you shouldn't have invited me to your house. You see, I see people who have passed on and I don't talk about it, but there's someone in your house and he stays there. He stays there in the room across the bathroom. And he mentioned something about him passing away from an accident. But what I remember she mentioned that he said was, pray for him and he'll leave. My sister thought it was weird, but to that point, I had never shared any of my experiences with her. Like my brother knew, but she didn't know. And when I told her of everything I had experienced, she was shook. And after that, I felt validated. I just felt like I didn't imagine these things. So I haven't been to my parents' house since the pandemic. The last time I was there um, was for Christmas in 2019. And just like old times, the bathroom door closed on its own. Though this time, you know, when we heard it close, I looked up at my siblings and we just looked at each other like we just knew. And it's weird. Still looking back at it, I'm really skeptic about it, but I know I saw those things and I heard those things happen. So there you have it. And I also want to say thank you for this outlet. I can honestly say it's been therapeutic in so many ways. So, you know, keep going and I hope you're doing well. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Another bevy of strange experiences. But how about that validation? The brother-in-law's reaction to the home has got to help Jay feel a little bit better. Now, if only we could get the brother-in-law to call in. I bet he has some tales to tell. Thanks again, Jay, for calling. Now, folks, don't forget, you can support the show and get yourself some awesome Monsters Among Us gear simply by visiting MonstersAmongUsPodcast.com and by clicking that shop tab. Now is a great time to pick up the brand new Halloween shirt before they're gone. Now I shove my hand back in the bag of possibilities and yank out yet another sinister story. This time, also from the state of California. Please welcome Britta. Hi, so my name is Britta and I am located in California and my story is about the time I went to Old Town and their mines. I was visiting Old Town with a field trip group when I was younger and when we were in the mines itself, I remember turning down a dark tunnel and I started hearing a knocking noise coming from the wall. And as we made our way down the hallway, it started getting louder and I could start hearing drilling noises. And I was like, okay, this is a mine. There's got to be drilling noises. And then we were let off to explore in this little area. And I turned to find what the drilling noise was from because I was curious. And when I got there, I saw a humanoid figure. It was small. I'm already short at 4'11", so it was shorter than that. It was about maybe three feet tall, as far as I could tell. It had blue skin, bluish tint to it. That might have been the mine coloring though. And it had long, elongated ears that kind of looked malformed. There was just something kind of off, like the skin just wasn't hanging correctly. And it just gave me really terrible vibes. It was really terrifying, it filled me with dread. And I was I was creeped out by it because I wasn't expecting anyone to be down there. And I could see it swinging something, I think it was a pickaxe or something similar against the wall. And that was where the knocking noise was coming from. It was really dark down there and it was kind of hard to see. It was like 
you know, a child or not. So I had called out. And when it turned around, it had kind of yellow eyes, like cat eyes, you know, glow in the dark type of eyes. And it really freaked me out. And I thought that I would just share that with you because I have no idea what it is. And I thought maybe, maybe you would have some idea. Thanks. Thank you, Britta. It sounds like you might have encountered a Tommy knocker. Or at least something that fits that description. Now, knockers, knackers, or tommy knockers are subterranean, gnome, or elf like creatures from Cornish and Devon folklore over in England. Mischievous little buggers, said to only be about two feet tall, with huge heads, long arms, white whiskers, and wrinkled skin, and oftentimes are seen carrying mining equipment. Now, this legend followed settlers to America, where mining was and still is huge. Places like Pennsylvania, Nevada, Colorado, and even California, where Britta had her experience. Now, given that this is a grab bag episode, I can't go much deeper than this for now, but I promise we will further explore the tummy knockers on a future episode. In the meantime, up next we have what appears to be a wild one, out of Washington. Ash, welcome to the program. Hello there, Derek. This is Ash of Washington State. I have a brief story to share from my years as a mystical supplies proprietor in Ontario, Canada. Despite running a retail store, people often turned up to the shop looking to resolve paranormal issues, and this was something that continued long after the shop closed. I think it was around the year 2000 or so when an older couple uh, approached with a concern about their rural property. They typically cut and burnt dead brush in the spring. For a number of years, something had been manifesting in the fire. They were frightened that a demon may be occupying the land and feeding off these flames. They said they'd taken many photographs which they kept in an album at home, and I arranged a visit to view the pictures. I, along with others who worked at the shop, arrived at their delightful little cabin, a rustic place that felt warm and inviting. They brought out their photo albums. They had photos across a few years of large bonfires with a very clear, huge creature in the flames. But it didn't look demonic by any typical iconography. It looked like a traditional wyvern found in mythology. It had a draconic head with horns and spiked ridges, a long serpentine neck and massive bat-like wings. The photographs showed the creature from a variety of angles and in an array of positions. The others and I agreed on the dragon-like appearance of the flames and promised to get back to them with any further information we could dig up. Delving into the local libraries and interlibrary loans, I found a lot of dragon myth, but not unexpectedly. Not much from a paranormal or more literal perspective. I finally came across an old self-published journal from a self-proclaimed dragon researcher who had chronicled his various expeditions throughout North America in search of dragons. His book noted sightings, observations of evidence, included diagrams and photographs. In a chapter of this unusual book, the man wrote about what he termed fire drakes, which he described as dragon forms reoccurring in large fires in certain geological areas. The book included photographs that bore a striking resemblance to the couple's photos. His notes stated that in his observations, these drakes had never caused any harm nor interacted with any person, that in his opinion, They should not be a cause for concern and simply be a sight to be enjoyed. 
I relayed these writings to the couple, explaining that I could not vouch for any validity in the author's writing, as it was an unconventional topic and a book with no scientific substantiation, but that the photographs included were similar to their own. This information seemed to alleviate their concerns that some fireborn demon was intent on burning their home, and they were very thankful for the help. Thank you, Ash, for not only the phone call, but for doing all that research for me. I was happy to sit back and learn here with the audience. Because while the term fire drake might ring some bell in my head, I'll be honest and tell you I don't really know anything about the legend and or the phenomena. Now, I did try to find some info online to share with you, but everything I pulled was in reference to Tolkien rather than cryptids or elementals but I did throw a link to the infamous Wyvern up in the show notes. Just hit up monstersamonguspodcast.com and click the show notes tab. Now, I'd love to have a look at a couple of these photographs that you mentioned, Ash. So if you happen to have them or have access to them and don't mind sharing, get in touch with me. Either way, thank you for the super interesting phone call. Alright folks, it's time to pay a few more bills, but I'll be right back with more Eerie Tales. I'm still hungry as if I had never... Today, top of the fourth inning. Things are getting more expensive. It's a nature's fruits and veggies supplement. Now, for this next entry, we begin down in Texas. Jed, welcome to the show. Hi Derek, this is Jed from Austin, Texas. I have two stories for you, both of which took place in California and involve people who were there one minute, gone the next. So the first experience took place in November of 1996 when I was 25 years old, near Pebble Beach, California. I was on a road trip with my fiance at the time. We had both just gotten back to the States after living overseas for two years in Japan, where we had met and become engaged. Now, our relationship had run into some serious problems. We were taking a road trip up the coast to clear our heads and decide about our future together. It was about 10.30 a.m. on this day. We had just driven on the 17-mile drive. This is a scenic road along the coast and near the famous Pebble Beach Golf Course. It was a cloudy day, but visibility was very good. We saw no other cars on the road. After driving for a few minutes, I realized that I wasn't sure how to get back onto Highway 1, which I mentioned out loud to my fiancé. Almost immediately, I noticed a pedestrian up ahead on the right shoulder, walking in our direction along the side of the road. There were no other people around. It was a male who wore jeans and a hoodie that covered his eyes. His hands were in his pockets and he was looking slightly downward as he walked. I decided to slow down to stop and ask this man directions. As our car approached, I suddenly felt very tongue-tied, which was unusual for me. I rolled down the passenger side window and nudged my fiance to ask him for directions. She too had trouble getting her words out. Finally, I managed to ask him about how to get back to the highway. He leaned into the window a bit, but we could still not see his eyes, just his mouth. I could see that he had olive skin and very white teeth. He simply said, you are on the right path. We just sat there for a minute and then without saying a word, I drove off slowly from the shoulder and back onto the road. I managed to say to my fiance, what a nice man. But when I looked into the rearview mirror, I couldn't see him. So I stopped the car in the middle of the road since there were still no other cars in sight, turned my body around to look out the rear window. My fiance did the same thing. The man was gone, nowhere in sight. This happened within five seconds of our leaving his side. There were no trees or other natural or man-made barriers for him to hide behind, even if he had decided to suddenly dive out of sight. We were both dumbstruck and I drove on for about 30 more minutes before we could speak or felt normal again. Now the second experience took place in the summer of 2011 in Irvine, California. It was about 11 p.m. I was walking with my lifelong best friend, Andy, who had come to visit me at my dad's house while I was in town visiting from Texas. My dad lived in the affluent Turtle Rock area of Irvine. We were walking on a long road that had very long, slow curve to it and featured a small private college at the bottom of the hill. We were walking on a sidewalk next to some lawns and other low cut landscaping. We hadn't seen anybody else during our entire walk that evening. 
Suddenly, we noticed a man walking toward us up the hill on the same sidewalk. He was dressed casually in street clothing. He looked to be Asian, maybe 22 or so. As he approached us, he said, Hey, do you guys know where the party is? It was a very unusual question. There were never any raging parties around there. Something just didn't feel right to both of us. Andy is a police officer and I have a PhD in psychology, so we both have solid observational skills. Andy immediately went into cop mode, standing to the side of the man in case he pulled something funny. We told the man, no, we're not aware of any parties. The man shrugged and continued walking up the hill behind us, and we continued on our way down the hill. Almost immediately, Andy and I turned around just to make sure he wasn't following us. But when we did, he was nowhere to be seen. Completely gone. Even if he had taken off in a sprint, there was just no way even a professional sprinter could have made it up the hill and around the bend out of sight that fast behind us. There was just nowhere for him to hide. He was just gone. So that's my second experience. You can see some clear similarities between the two experiences. In both cases, my fellow witness was very significant to me, either a fiancé or a lifelong best friend, and we were on a road. In both cases, the person disappeared immediately after we took our eyes off of him. In both his instances, witnesses were in a clear-headed state of mind, no alcohol in our systems, and we were well-rested. Both of these people or beings looked just like real people, totally solid, not translucent at all. However, that's where the similarities end. I got a very different vibe from each person. The man in the Pebble Beach encounter felt like a higher being, like maybe an angel or Jesus. We both felt almost immediately unworthy to speak to him. Meanwhile, the man in Irvine felt like a ghost. He seemed like a normal guy who was just disoriented and lost. Anyway, Derek, those are my disappearing person stories. I hope you can use them on the show. Thanks. Thank you, Chad. Now, you know I'm getting black-eyed kid vibes from both of these experiences, if I'm honest. And like Blue Line's call earlier with the red orb, I have no shortage of these types of calls either. Disappearing strangers, typically on the road, which it seems like both of these encounters were as well, or at least close to the route. But I don't know what to make of those or this one either, but I sure do enjoy them. And I thank you again, Chad, for taking the time. Now, folks, real quick before I continue, it's the spooky season. So I bet a lot of you are out there looking for paranormal films to binge. So why not add my film to that list? There are tons of ghosts, creatures, and UFOs. And me. So what more would you possibly want? And you can rent this thing for only five bucks over on Amazon. And we're not getting a lot of help marketing-wise with this film, so word of mouth is huge. If you've seen it and liked it, share it with others that might like it as well. You can visit PeregoTriangle.com to learn more. And for you international folks, I know you're patiently waiting, and I'm doing my best to push the process forward. But you see, I'm a tiny fish in a vast ocean. So this is taking some time. Now let's pull one last name out of the hat here. Nick, welcome to the show. Hey Derek, this is Nick. I absolutely love the work you've done with your podcast, and I just wanted to let you know it helped get me through plenty of night shifts. I wanted to share an experience that took place in December 2009 in a small town called Erie, Pennsylvania. During this time, I was performing in a local metal band. And just to paint the picture, we were certainly not your satanic goth-style band. We were more interested in playing metal just for the incredible energy and aggression release. In other words, our lyrics were not meant to be something to conjure up any malicious spiritual behavior. I performed quite harsh vocals, though, for this band, in addition to playing guitar. As college kids, we were all low on funds and took it upon ourselves to record a DIY album. Most of the recording sessions took place in our bass player's college dormitory with his iMac computer and a litany of improvised sound equipment. As we finished recording the instruments, we figured it would be best to move to a more isolated location to record the vocals. 
Had we stayed in the dorm room, the campus police would have likely been called when students in the other rooms heard the harsh sounds. Instead, we decided to venture to our bass player's parents' house in Erie, Pennsylvania. The home was several generations old and gave off an ominous presence as we arrived that winter day. We felt an unsettling energy as we climbed the stairs to his childhood bedroom. He had mentioned that his old room always gave him the creeps, and he was relieved to have moved out. But luckily, it was just the space we needed to record this final component of our album. In an attempt to have a completely isolated recording space, I set up a microphone in a nearby coat closet. It was literally the smallest closet you could imagine. We didn't even bother to remove all of the coats and clothing items due to lack of time. The microphone wires were pulled through the crack in the door and strung down the hallway to our bass player and his computer down the hall. I crouched on my knees and began the recording process. Something about the closet made me feel very unnerved. The pitch blackness and lack of oxygen certainly didn't help matters. But I was focused on getting the task done as quickly as possible so I could get out of there. Once all of my vocal parts were recorded several hours later, we saved the audio files, packed up our gear, and left. It wasn't until years later that I received a phone call from my bandmate who had recorded the album. He sounded extremely confused. He told me he had been deleting some old files on his computer and stumbled upon my old vocal recordings. As he was clearing out the files, he noticed something peculiar and sent one piece to me. Although my vocals appear scary in their own right, just after the words over our head were screamed, a strange childish voice is heard giggling from within the closet. We were all perplexed upon hearing this sound file. I recalled the precautions we took that day to ensure the closet was totally isolated for recording. The only sounds picked up by the computer in a distant bedroom would have come from the microphone I was using. While this may have easily been some sort of recording artifact, I can't help but think that an entity might have been sharing that space with me that day. To think it was having a laugh at the outlandish noises I was making while intruding upon its hiding place. Ooh, an EVP call. Thank you, Nick. And of course, most of you should know by now what an EVP is. But for those that don't, it stands for Electronic Voice Phenomenon. In short, a disembodied voice captured on any sort of recording device. A ghostly voice. And Nick was kind enough to send us his EVP. So let's take a listen. Now I'll play this thing a few times, narrowing down the length each time until it's only the giggle part that you hear. And as Nick mentioned, the vocals are a little jarring without the accompanying music. So heads up, I guess. Go for Raven! Sound of silence! Man! Sound of I don't know. That certainly sounds like a giggle to me. What do you all think? Regardless of what anyone else hears, we thank you, Nick, for sharing the call and the recording with us. We don't get a lot of EVPs here on the show, so it's always a lot of fun when we do. All right, folks, that's going to do it for this episode. Thank you so much for joining me. Trust me when I say it's a whole lot less weird when you do. Now, Monsters Among Us is written and produced by me, Derek Hayes. Copyright Red Crow Media. Additional support is provided by Sarah Carter Hayes and Delaney Bowers. All media used in this production is done so under the protection of fair use. Be sure to follow us on social media and over at YouTube as well. And while you're online, please leave us a rate and review wherever that sort of thing is possible. And don't forget about our film, Shadows in the Desert, High Strangeness, and the Borrego Triangle. Just visit borregotriangle.com.
to learn more. And as always, you can find us on the digital airwaves every Saturday at 11 p.m. Eastern over at the UnX Network. Just visit unxnetwork.com to tune in. And finally, tonight's score was provided by Iron Cthulhu Apocalypse, Co.ag Music, and Carl Casey at White Bat Audio. Thank you again so much for stopping by. We'll catch you back here on Tuesday for another episode. And you'll want to have the lights on for that one. And of course, each and every Wednesday, you can catch Monsters Among Us Jr. anywhere you get your podcast. If it's not, let me know and I'll have our people get on it. Delaney and I are really enjoying the support as people slowly make their way over there. And trust me when I say, they may be youngsters, but there's some good yarns in there. Now catch me on the other side of the outro to hear how you can get more Monsters Among Us for free. Until then, keep it spooky and have a good night. Now, I figured for this week's secret entry, I'd pick something that had a little bit of everything to offer. And based on what little I know about the following call, that's exactly what we have. Cindy, from Indiana. Welcome to tonight's program. Hi, this is Cindy calling from Avon, Indiana. I'm really enjoying your podcast. So I have a true story. But anyway, my father encountered a UFO back in 78 to 79, and he was a school teacher at the time of the fifth grade. Well, anyway, he had a new puppy named Sandy, and she was a toddler, and he was taking it to a friend to visit in Brownsburg, Indiana, out in the country. And we lived in Indianapolis at the time. Uh, My dad decided to go ahead and take the puppy and visit his friend in Brownsburg, Indiana. And he was a teacher just like he was. And so on his way, about halfway there out in the country on a desolate country road in Indiana, my father somehow, the car stalled. The radio went off and the air inside the car began to get stifling hot. And dad had difficulty breathing. And that was when he began to hear a strange humming noise above the car. It was in a flying saucer, was a black flying saucer, sort of metallic. And it was spinning and making the usual UFO sounds. And my father realized he was being transported back in the time. 56, 57, he saw the people through that time and era. They were not aware of him, but he was aware of them. He could hear them speaking in cards to each other as they passed by. And he said that what was so amazing about the scene was, you know how the cars today, if you see older-fashioned cars, they look kind of out of place. Well, he said the cars back then, one thing amazing, they looked like vintage cars out of a car dealer, like they were brand new the first day. And anyway, about an hour of this, he passed out and saw the dog. And when he came to, he realized he looked at his watch, his watch had stopped. At that hour, about 4.45 p.m. in the afternoon on a Saturday when he had encountered this strange, mysterious craft above him and how he found himself 
still in his car, and the motor was back to running, and the radio was on, and that's what woke him up. The radio was playing modern music instead of the 1950 era's rock music, and that's what struck him. Then when he looked at his watch, he realized his watch had stopped, and he said to himself, well, hey, I've lost an hour's worth of time. And so, but anyway, he found himself on the outskirts of Indianapolis, parked on an interstate berm, and the modern traffic was whizzing past him and nobody stopped to help, which was typical. Anyway, Dad somehow made his way home and told Mom about it, and she believed him, and we all did, and he felt like the men in black or the government was out to get him for the rest of his life because he had this UFO sighting, but he never reported at the time. But he actually went back in time and had some other time travels, experiences, and some other monster-related sightings. He met Bigfoot. We met Bigfoot on my family farm. And the next weekend, you know, that night, there was a red glowing orb in the backyard, and the UFO was back. And it was like a red orb that just suddenly appeared one evening in the backyard. And it was like it was spinning around and taking pictures, and the light flashes came out of the light orb like it was taking pictures of us. Well, here's a point I want to get to. And the following night, we had an encounter with Dogman. Everybody knows who Dogman is. Well, anyway, we were enjoying our new color TV set back in the 70s. That was quite a feat if you got your first color TV. That was a big deal. And we were watching the TV for the first time in color. All of a sudden, you know, we had scratching sounds outside on the outdoor patio sliding glass door. And the drapes were pulled. It was toward dusk and the two dogs in the family room were sleeping. We had a black and white dog named Backyard Gate. That's what's their name. And we had Sandy, of course, and we had two cats. And we also had a parakeet named Petey who made noises and could hiccup to imitate my brother, and he imitated my mother by laughing, and he could do all kinds of sound effects. He was obnoxious as the day is long. But anyway, just to let you know, we encountered Dogman that weekend. Uh, he was calling at the sliding glass door trying to get in because he smelled her food. And anyway, Mom says, I'm going to call the cops. And Dad says, no, you're not. She says, I'm going to take a broom. And he says, no, you're not. And then he runs back to his bedroom and brings out a silver chest full of silver coins. He says, what's the only way to carry an American werewolf? Yes, there are American werewolves in Indiana and the rest of the United States because we encountered one that night. And my dad showed him the uh, silver coin chest, which was heavy with real pure silver. And he says, here you go. And the werewolf took one look at that and screamed bloody murder and ran off into the night. That's not the end of my monsters, but I hope you enjoyed it. My name is Cindy. I live in a retirement home in Avon, Indiana. So hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy, for calling in. Wowzers. There's a lot going on in this call. A UFO abduction. Time travel. Bigfoot. Red orbs. There you go, blue line. And even a dog man. Now, it's hard to know what to think about all this, but I do know one thing. I had a lot of fun listening. And for that, we can't thank you enough, Cindy. Thanks for calling in. Alright folks, this is the point that we go beyond. If you'd like to join us, visit patreon.com and join our $5 level. You can even do a 7-day trial for absolutely free. Or get an ad-free version for just $1. It's over in the beyond that we share more spooky stories. But tonight, we're doing something a little bit different. For those longtime Monster Squad members, you may remember that we occasionally share what I call rebuttals. Which is basically any call that comes in that doesn't necessarily leave a story. But rather addresses past calls or offers new information. Now, I call them rebuttals because early on, most of them were actual rebuttals. Folks calling in to debunk certain calls. But these days, it's a lot less black and white. But unfortunately, the name has stuck. 
So that is the theme for this evening's bonus content. So stay tuned while I share some additional information from listeners like you. Corrections, debunkings, corroborations. You'll find it all on this, the next installment of the Rebuttal Special Episodes. And we kick it off tonight with a call from the Commonwealth of Virginia. Please join me in welcoming Wolf and the rest of tonight's rebuttals. This is Wolf from Virginia. I've called in a few times, but I'm listening to an older, really old episode, uh, season five, episode 18. And you're talking about wood knocking and the theory that they're making it with their, with their uh, Sasquatches, Bigfoots, they're making it with their mouth. Wood knocking is actually established in primate behavior. Gorillas do it, orangutans do it, chimpanzees do it. It actually, you can do it and it won't leave marks on trees. 